Imagine only having to work half the year and making a six-figure income as a doctor. Early in my medical training, being a hospitalist sounded like the sweetest gig, so I chose to finish residency and took my first job doing just that, working half the year for a six-figure income. But ultimately, I chose to leave. Here's why, let's break it down. Hey friends, welcome back to the channel. In case you're new here, my name is Lux. I'm a board-certified internal medicine physician. I'm a former hospitalist and currently a cardiology fellow. And today is going to be one of the first episodes in a new series that we're doing here on the channel called Why I Didn't Go Into, which is essentially a breakdown of all the specialties I consider or didn't consider and breaking down my personal reasons of why I didn't go into that field. And by no means is this series intended to bash a specific specialty. I think there's just so much content out there of people explaining why they picked the field they ultimately went into. I've done the same thing here on this channel, but I don't think there's enough of why people didn't pick specific fields. I'm just going to break down my specific reasons in case you're interested in a specific field, as well as reasons of why that field may be a good fit for you. So if you want to make sure that you don't miss any of those upcoming episodes in the series, including why I didn't pick fields like surgery, emergency medicine, family medicine, or orthopedic surgery, and so much more, make sure you hit that like and subscribe button. But the first episode in the series, I'm going to break down exactly why I chose not to ultimately pursue being a full-time hospitalist after doing it for a year. And also in the episode, I'll break down who I do think the career would be a good fit for in case you're considering being a full-time hospitalist. And before I explain my reasons of why I left being a hospitalist, let me kind of just quickly break down my journey of actually getting into hospitalist medicine. So after I finished medical school, I did three years of internal medicine residency. This is where you basically get to make the choice of either being a general medicine doctor or doing subspecialty like cardiology, which I'm doing right now. Now during the latter parts of that training, I was still torn between going into hospitals medicine because it allowed you to have so much flexibility. Again, you only worked half the year or doing a subspecialty like cardiology. And so because I was still torn and undecisive and also because cardiology fellowship is so competitive, I said, well, let me make sure I set myself up for at least getting a good hospitalist job in the town or the city that we wanted. So after finishing residency, my wife and I made a decision to go ahead and move back closer to family and take a job as a hospitalist there while I applied for cardiology fellowship in case I chose to pursue that route. For us, this was the right move because we wanted to be closer to the family as we were expecting our first child. So then whatever happened in the cards in terms of getting into fellowship or hospitalist job being amazing, we just kind of ran with the results. And so during my final months of internal medicine residency, I interviewed and applied for a bunch of internal medicine hospitalist jobs, which I documented here on the channel. You guys can check that out. I'll link that playlist down below. And I managed to get a job that was really close to family. It was also just an overall good gig. And I knew that if the job was great, I could continue to do that for the rest of my career. And if there were still some hesitations, I could go down the cardiology route, which I ultimately did. So that was my journey into being a hospitalist. Let's quickly break down exactly what a hospitalist is. It's basically a board certified internal medicine physician, usually an internal medicine doctor, but you also have hospitalists that are family medicine trained, even pediatrics. So if you wanted to be a hospitalist at a children's hospital, for example, there's an extra fellowship that you do after pediatric residency to do this. But overall, the job is very similar. You basically admit patients and take care of patients and discharge patients that are in the hospital. You're not anyone's primary medicine doctor by any means. You just take care of who comes in, you discharge them, you manage them, you work with other consultants in the hospital, and you basically have a constant turnover of patients and a good combination of old patients that you've been taking care of the past few days, as well as new patients who may just have been admitted the last night. And usually the schedule will be about 10 to 12 hour shifts from 7 a.m. to 5 or 7 p.m., seven days in a row with another entire week completely off. No one calls you, no one bothers you, that is your time for yourself. There are some schedules, which I've done a version of, where you work four days in a row and then three days off and you basically come back. So you essentially get a three or four day weekend, depending on where in that cycle you are, but ultimately a hospital schedule is set very nicely. If you want flexibility to travel, etc., where you have set time that you know you're going to be off and set time that you know you're going to be on work. And as I've alluded to before, it is a six figure income. Depending on where you are in the country, you'll be making anywhere from 250 to 350. Usually I would find that most people are between the 250 and $300,000 range. Again, some areas may be paying less. Some people may be paying significantly more. Also just depends on the compensation structure of the group or the company that you work for. So now all of that overall sounds very nice. Why did I leave? Here are the few reasons. Number one is ownership of patients. At least the institution that I worked at, and I saw this at my residency training institution as well, is that when you're a hospitalist, yes, you are the main doctor that's written and listed on the chart as this is the person in charge of this patient. But if the patient has a lot of consultants involved, for example, if you have somebody who comes in with chest pain, somebody with renal problems on their labs, liver problems, maybe they have problems of rheumatologic diseases or they have a cancer history, often hospitalist doctors are told or trained or used to and build a habit of involving those specialists to also help in the care of that patient. It makes sense if a patient has cancer, active cancer, and you need the oncologist to help you, that service will follow the patient alongside you. If the patient has worsening renal function while they're in the hospital, it's normal that you'll call the renal doctor. Now, depending on where you work, how much that team takes over for that part of their care varies. But at least at the institution that I was a hospitalist at, if I call, for example, the pulmonary critical care team because a patient was 
a little bit tenuous. They were sick, but not sick enough to go to the ICU. Often that service would start taking care of even the small things for that patient just to avoid them coming to the ICU. If I called the nephrology team for a kidney problem, often they would also be managing their electrolytes and their blood pressures. And it just, again, would take the ownership out of my hands because I was calling them for one specific problem. Now the hospital that I worked at has a bunch of private groups that work within it. So the nephrology group is private, the GI group is private, and they're incentivized to see as many patients and to do as much work as possible during their time. So by no means are they going to not want to see a patient. They get financially incentivized to see those patients and to help you out. Because they do, they will take over all the parts of their care to make sure that that patient is best taken care of by them. And so you can imagine that if you have a patient who's very sick, which is very common, that has five, six, seven, eight chronic problems and maybe two to three acute problems, often, although you're their medicine doctor, Technically, you have a lot of subspecialties that are doing different aspects of their care. You're just kind of reading notes at times and documenting what each service is recommending or doing or what orders they're putting. And you're almost trying to just keep tabs of what all the services are doing for that patient. And you feel more of like a coordinator than you do of an actual physician. Not always, but was a big issue for me is that I didn't feel like I always had ownership of my patients. As another example of this, now being on the other side of cardiology, this was really interesting. When I would have a patient who would come in with chest pain, the story didn't really seem like they were having a heart attack, but they had a decent enough story. Maybe they got a stress test or an echo. Often the cardiology team would be called by the nighttime hospitalist. By the time that I took this patient over, they had a workup kind of done. They had the cardiology team already called and they had a workup pending. So I had to wait for the cardiology service to basically say the patient could go home after their stress test and their echo is read as normal. That's pretty much all I did as their hospitalist. I didn't really take care of their chest pain. Maybe I gave them some meds for their discomfort, etc. Or if they had other problems, I took care of them. But it wasn't until I got the green light from cardiology that the patient was able to go home. I wasn't really the decision maker on if the patient was safe or not, if I was still pending on another service to say yes or no. Now on the flip side, I'm a cardiology fellow. I get to be kind of that beacon of saying, cool, this patient is stable, their chest pain is fine, their echo results are good, you can discharge them if you feel comfortable. I like this side of the fence much more where I get to evaluate the results and make decisions on if a patient needs more treatment, more workup, or saying they're okay, we can see them in clinic, this is not a heart attack for example. And then relay that to the medicine doctor and saying I've made my decision, I'm going to go on and take care of the next patient. On the flip side, as a medicine doctor, I was waiting for other services to essentially tell me like, is this person good enough to go home? Again. Ownership didn't feel like something I always had control of. That's one big reason that I left. Number two is being in a discharge focused system. Now again, you're having a constant churn of patients. The hospital is incentivized to take care of patients as best as possible. You don't want people to come back because that's a ding against the hospital, ding against your service, your company. So you wanna make sure you take care of patients as best as possible. But ultimately you need beds to be open and available for other patients that are in the emergency room or coming from other facilities. And so the focus is always, what is the barriers for this patient to be able to get out of the hospital? Do they need rehab? Can they go home? Is it just that they need oxygen? Like, or is their treatment done? Are they medically stable for them to go to another kind of step down facility? Often you'll have patients that are not safe enough to go home because maybe they've had a long hospital stay, but they're still not sick enough to be in a hospital. So then you would send them to another facility like a rehab or an LTAC or a SNF. These are facilities that could take care of the patients as a bridge before they get home to get strong enough to get more treatment. Maybe they need antibiotics for an X amount of week, but they're not gonna be able to get that at home, but you don't want them to be in the hospital for X weeks just getting antibiotics to their IVs, you send them somewhere else. And often I feel like that was the majority of my job is basically asking every day, why is this patient still here? And what are the things they need before they go home? What are the things they need in terms of follow-ups, meds, equipment, supplies that they need to best be taken care of at home? Because again, you don't want patients to be coming back for things that you could have avoided. It happens, but that felt like a big part of my job. Not the reason you become a doctor, which is asking, how do I get this patient out of the hospital, right? It's about taking care of patients, taking care of diseases, making people feel better, but often the institution the system makes you as a doctor feel like what is the checklist that are having to be done before this patient can go home literally in my notes that i would write in the hospitalist i would have one section at the bottom for the social workers for myself everyone to be accountable of saying these are the things that the patient has left to be done they're still on oxygen then you get off of it they're waiting on a culture results it gave me a mental framework to maybe make it feel more medicine but that was a big part of my note of saying this is what's left for the patient to still be here and ultimately leave and these are the things that they'll need on the day of discharge so again the being the discharge focus system 
system is not the reason that I went into medicine in the first place. I knew it was a big part of being a hospitalist, but ultimately I realized that I didn't like it enough to enjoy the other aspects of the job. Number three, at times the job got intellectually dry. I'll get a little bit more into this into the next point, but being a hospitalist, you don't really get to control obviously what comes to you and not everything, every condition that you face, despite it being a medical problem, is something you're interested in. For example, one of my least favorite organ systems of taking care of for problems happens to be GI. Things like diarrhea, abdominal pain, GI bleeds, alcoholic cirrhosis, patients who are decompensated liver failures, because often you are not able to fix things yourself. You need a consultant. Often you may not know where their diarrhea or their constipation is like coming from and various things have already been tried before they're coming to you. Often things like decompensated cirrhosis, the patient is so confused they get in their own way of being able to do the medicine aspect of it. And it becomes a little bit more algorithmic. You can imagine if a patient comes in that is pregnant, that is not far enough in their pregnancy for the ob gyn service to take care of them. You are so focused on not making sure you screw up anything that you often don't to take care of the full patient. You're a little bit very hesitant in all of your decision makings. You tend to call consultants a little bit quicker just because it's a patient that is pregnant. If you have patients who are homeless, often you'll take care of them. You'll see this patient was just in the hospital five days ago, but they didn't pick up their meds. Maybe they couldn't afford it. Maybe they are back here with a drug intoxication and you're kind of having the same conversations. And so those are the ones that you say, okay, like I can take care of the patient. Like this patient has cellulitis, like I can take care of it. Not the most exciting. Again, this varies from person to person, but for me, there were certain conditions that I was actually very interested in. I had somebody, for example, had a pregnant patient that was like 27 that had a new rash after a recent travel. That felt very exciting because it felt very internal medicine, residence, med school kind of case that you're given. You're like, what could that be? Like that felt very fun. Most of my patients are not like that. Often it's like this patient has cellulitis. This patient stepped on a nail and they have a wound that could have osteomyelitis. Please do a workup to see is their bone infected or not. And often you're calling other consultants. This person hasn't drank a lot of fluid and their kidney functions look terrible because they're dehydrated. You kind of already have diagnosed them. Most uh, emergency medicine doctors may have diagnosed them already at that point and you're just managing the care. So because the patient senses is not in control, you could have 15 patients out of your 16 or 17 be things that you're just not that interested in and that can be hard when you're having those same patients over and over again the motivation to go to work may not be as high compared to if you're working in a job where all the patients tend to have problems that you're interested in taking care of number four the dumping ground syndrome so this phenomenon varies where you work but i would say for a majority of places hospitalist medicine tends to get majority of the dump what that means is that if there's another service that doesn't want to take care of a patient as their primary, they may call the medicine doctor to be the primary caretaker. Or often institutions are set where that service may not have a primary service. For example, orthopedics at the institution I worked at would do the surgeries, they would see the patients after their operation, but they wouldn't have the framework, the team set up to be able to take care of these patients independently. So they would then admit them to the medicine service and then they would round on them in the next morning to say like, how's this person doing on their second day of recovery. What else needs to be done? When can they go home? But as a medicine doctor, you're often admitting patients for other services that don't have a primary service. So during my time as a hospitalist, I took care of a lot of patients that would take care of my neurosurgery, orthopedic surgery, general medicine, patients that were coming down from the ICU where they would have a long stay, they were no longer sick for the ICU, and the critical care team didn't want to follow them on the floor. Very normal. You want them to be taking care of patients in the ICU. But then this very complicated patient who's been there for 20, 30 days is now your responsibility. And if the notes haven't been great, which often they're not, you would have to either be a good doctor and decipher all of those and break those down to good note or risk not being able to capture everything that's happened with that patient. Personally, I would spend like an hour or two going through the patient's old notes and making sure we already are on track of all the consultants that have seen them, what needs to be done when they go home. But again, it doesn't feel like the most medicine aspect of it. But in most institutions, a lot of the simplistic or the grunt work will go down to the hospitalist. On a similar note, you may also be getting admissions from the emergency room that don't feel the most medicine, but it's more of a safety thing. For example, you can have an 80 year old who is falling at home, who just needs a place to be kind of discharged to like a rehab facility or a nursing home because they're not safe or independent at home. Again, doesn't feel like the most medicine thing for me to do, but that person needs a doctor to take care of them to essentially work with the social workers of coordinating the best place and the safest place for them to be. It just happens to be you because there's no going to be else as a hospitalist that's going to do that. So again, that dumping ground syndrome is very strong 
wrong, different at different institutions, but definitely at the one that I worked at, it was very common that if no one else wanted to take responsibility or be the primary team or had the ability to be in the primary team, it would go down to the hospitalist. Now, again, this is something I definitely knew going in, but I had no idea of how much of my job was going to be that and being okay with that for the next 10 to 15 years, which is really what all this comes down to. That was not something I was going to be satisfied with. Now, on the point of 10 to 15 years or 20 or 30, there was definitely something that I noticed, which was a lack of professional progress. Now, in other jobs, and I'll allude to this in my cardiology videos, I've alluded to this in other videos I've made on different specialties, is that there is always kind of a long-term track. You kind of know what you want to build, what you want your life to look like professionally. And being a hospitalist is either you work more hours if you want to make more money, or you go into admin if you don't want to be doing clinical all the time. And by no means do I want to be an administrator of a hospital, administrator of a group. Like, I want to take care of patients. I want to do what I do now as a cardiologist, which is read images, read stretch tests, take care of patients in clinic and the hospital, and then come home and enjoy time with my family. I don't want to be managing other doctors or other admin people that are not in medicine and try to make decisions. Like, that is not interesting. But that is kind of where you go as a hospitalist. You can be a director of like a skilled nursing facility or a rehab facility. But again, it's more of an admin role. Or you can be kind of a supervising hospitalist of a larger group. Or again, you can just work and make more money by doing more clinical hours. But when you work in seven days in a row, often 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., you're not really interested, especially as you get older, to work more shifts in a row. So I found myself asking cardiology versus staying as a hospitalist. So I was like, well, what's next? And if I could feel that I couldn't find that sense of progress in 10 to 15 years, I knew I'd be highly dissatisfied in my job. And I didn't want to be just be another doctor that's gone through all this training and says, I'm actually not a fan of it. It pays the bills. Kind of like what I do. Some patients are really interesting, but most of the job feels like a drag. And I definitely didn't want that. And then finally, feedback from colleagues. It's really weird when you are a 29 year old hospitalist. I think that's what how old I was when I first started. And having people that are in their 50s or 60s, some in their 70s, and saying, oh, I wish I had gone to fellow. Fellowship. Especially when I made it more public to my colleagues and definitely to my boss that I had applied to fellowship. If it works out, then I'd be leaving. They kind of knew that. And when they found out that I either was applying or that I got in and matched into my number one choice, I definitely started hearing more comments of like, oh, I'm so happy for you. Like, I wish I had done that. Or I consider cardiology or X amount of fields. And you start to see kind of the regret play in their minds. Because again, this person is doing all of the aspects that we just mentioned, the dumping ground, the grunt work, the dispositions, the intellectual dryness. And I, by no means am I saying that every hospitalist feels this way. Okay, there's obviously people that do this job that love it. But I do feel like it's a very common scenario to have some of these issues, if not all of them. And hearing from your colleagues that they wish they had gone the route that I ultimately did, which is to apply to fellowship, I knew I was making the right call. As a 29 year old, I didn't want to be a doctor at 49 or 59 and saying, man, like I had wished I had pursued more subspecialty because this job is not going to intrigue me long enough. That's completely different now when I'm in cardiology. And again, I've made videos about that. But hearing from your colleagues that they would have picked a different field is very telling. And if you're going to go down any path, including hospitalist, ask the people that are doing that job if they're interested. I knew when I was a third year resident, we would do this hospitalist rotation for a month. And every week we would work with a different hospitalist and do the same structure. We would admit patients, discharge them. And I remember working with somebody who had like three years out of training and they were already asking themselves, like, what's next? And when being 32 and asking yourself what's next in your career and already realizing that your career is not satisfying enough was also very telling. I still took the leap and faith to give it a shot. I'm glad I did. It's taught me a lot about efficiency and writing good notes um, and taking care of patients and how the system works, but by no means was this something that I was going to do for the rest of my life. And so those are the main reasons why I chose not to pursue hospital medicine. And before we get into the rest of the video, today's episode is brought to you by our very own Med School Blueprint. Now I knew when I was in medical school that I just wished there was one place where I could say, how do I study? How do I manage my time? When I'm in my rotations, how do I do that better? How do I get you know honors on each rotation? How do I do well in each course in my preclinical journey? How do I get into medical school? How do I study for step one, step two, step three, get into residency, doing well as a resident? And during each of those milestones, I was always looking for somebody to tell me, do A, B, and C, and don't do X. X, y, and Z. And because I couldn't find one place that would break down the do's and the don'ts of each single milestone of the medical journey, we went ahead and created that for you over the past seven years. If you check out the Med School Blueprint, you'll see the results from thousands of our students who have gone through our study programs, our time management programs, our rotation programs, board exam programs, all included in one price and one place. So if you're on your medical journey and you wish somebody would just give you very step-by-step -step, hand holding like advice on what to do on each phase of the journey, make sure you check out the Med School Blueprint. And as a bonus, if you sign up for the Med School Blueprint, any program 
programs, books, or anything we create in the future will also be included for absolutely no extra cost. And with our 30 day satisfaction guarantee, if you go through the blueprints and think it's not for you, by no means let us know and we'll go ahead and refund your purchase. So again, if you're looking to succeed on every phase of your medical journey and doing it with less stress, you just check out the results from thousands of our students and check out the med school blueprint down below. Now those are all the reasons of why I left being hospitalist, why I ultimately chose not to pick that as a career. And I know that hearing this, if I listen to this video, I'd be like, man, should I go down that career path? And again, for me, the answer was no, but giving it a shot helped me understand that that was a reason. But I also wanna shine light of who being a hospitalist is right for. So number one is if you want that flexibility, the schedule is very, very nice. When I was a hospitalist, my wife and I traveled a lot. We were expecting our first child, so that definitely made travel a little bit more planned because the further she got in her pregnancy, the more careful we had to be in terms of where we were going. But we went to place like New York several times, Hawaii, we traveled to India, we went to Canada, it was amazing. And I'm sure I'm missing trips on a journey that we went to, but it was very easy to schedule a four, five, seven day vacation somewhere. And as an extra ability to have flexibility, if for example, my wife and I went to India with family for about two weeks. And so because I was due to work at least one of those weeks, I just worked with some colleagues of taking some of their shifts while they covered me for that entire week and worked really smoothly. So that flexibility and predictability of knowing where your time is free is very nice. Number two is this clock in and clock out mindset. Most doctors are not off the clock when they go home. For example, when I'm a cardiology fellow, even now, despite not having patients of my own, I'm getting messages from nurses of saying like, hey, can you help with this? Or can you tell me who is on service for this? Or this patient called and they need X, Y, and Z. Technically, I'm not working today, but that doesn't mean that that patient doesn't need a doctor that will respond to them. So if there's not somebody that is going to be able to get back to that person, even though I'm home and I'm on vacation or I'm off and on the weekend, it's still my duty to respond to that patient and make sure they get their answers, especially if it's urgent. On the flip side, when you're hospitalist and it's 7 a.m., then you're on. When it's 7.01 and the nurses message you, then it's very easy for me to respond. Please reach out to X, Y, and Z. Again, if it's something you can quickly answer without forwarding it to your colleague, you should. But by no means is anyone going to fault you by not picking up the phone at 7.30. You are off the clock. That is very nice. So if you know you have evening plans with families or dinners, you will not get interrupted for emergency calls because you are not the doctor in charge at that time slot. And number three is being a jack of all trades. Although I alluded to not having ownership of all the patients, if you're really a hospitalist that loves just kind of taking control and having control of what the patient is getting in terms of a workup, in terms of treatment, you can. Consultant is not going to be involved in a patient unless you call them, right? So a lot of the cardiology patients, because I felt very comfortable as a resident, I would just do the workup myself. I wouldn't call the cardiology service unless something was abnormal or if they need cardiology to ultimately see them up in clinic, but that was me. But if I saw an oncology patient, which I was less comfortable with, I would often call them sooner and that's just a different comfort level. But things like renal disease, GI, rheumatologic stuff, endocrinology, cardiology, obviously, and just general internal medicine stuff, I felt very in control of. And so I enjoyed having all of that knowledge and practice and repetitions through these countless of patients. Because even now as a cardiology fellow, I will look at somebody's labs and saying, oh, I think this person has hypoaldosteronism, or I think this person has adrenal insufficiency. You don't think about that as a cardiologist, but it does change the matter of the care that patient gets if somebody is very internal medicine inclined or you have a good overall general foundation. So that guys is my breakdown of why I left being a hospitalist, but also some of the reasons of why you should still consider it if it's gonna be the field for you. Now I wanna know from you guys, if you enjoyed this aspect of the series, what specialties should I break down in future videos? Make sure you drop that in your comment section. And if you made it to the end of this episode and you enjoyed this video and you enjoyed the other ones that we made for you on this channel and the podcast, hit that like button. It really does support the channel. And also if you haven't hit that subscribe button as well as notification bell to know when new videos videos go live. And regardless of where you are in the medical journey, if you want to make sure you just crush it, but with the least amount of stress, go ahead and learn from my successes and my failures, as well as what countless of top students have done by checking out our med school blueprint. And again, there's a 30 day satisfaction guarantee. So if you're not happy with your purchase, we'll go ahead and refund you. No questions asked. And if you're somebody who's looking for a little bit more handholding, a little bit more guidance, definitely consider checking out some of our coaching programs to see if we can help you get better grades in just a few short weeks. All those links will be down below in the description. And if you enjoy this episode, you'll probably enjoy this episode right here on how exactly to choose your future career in just two minutes, as well as this episode right here on why I ultimately picked the field of cardiology. Enjoy these. And as always, my friends, thank you so much for being a part of my journey. Hopefully I was a little help to you guys on yours. I'll catch y'all in the next one. Peace.